Histories of medieval European medicine often include passing scattered references to a mysterious person called Trotula of Salerno. While most of the details of her life are unknown, she is said to have lived in the 11th or 12th century in the southern Italian city of Salerno. Among the various things said of her is that she was the first female professor of medicine and that she wrote an incredibly influential book called On the Diseases of Women. After her death, a collection of texts called The Trotula circulated widely throughout Europe, and she was commonly purported to be its author. But others cast doubt on these claims and argue that the entire story of Trotula is a myth, a fabrication of male medieval doctors looking to generate sales and build up a clientele of wealthy female patients. So who was this person, Trotula, and what is this text associated with her? More generally, what can we learn from this book about women and medicine in medieval Europe? These are some of the questions we'll tackle in this lecture. Trotula, it should be noted, is not a person's name. It is a title that simply means the little trotta, or the abbreviated trotta. And the person in question here was a woman whose name could have been either Trotta, Trocta, or Trota. We don't know, as it was a very common name at the time. Moreover, the text called the Trotula is not one book, but three. Three books that reflect the contributions of many different authors. Sometime around the end of the 12th century, an editor compiled these three books, revised them, and published them as a single edition. Originally written in Latin, the Trotula became so popular that by the beginning of the 15th century, it had been translated into almost all of Western Europe's vernacular languages, including Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, French, Dutch, German, and English. Reaching audiences all across the continent, it was undoubtedly the most popular collection of texts on women's medicine during the late medieval period. Because it is a patchwork of sources, a multi-authored collection of texts that contains bits and pieces from hundreds of different records, it offers a rather comprehensive overview of medieval European medicine. Looking at the Trotula, we can ask lots of big questions about this subject. Questions about the impact of Arabic medicine, about the relationship between learned methods and folk practices, about gender norms and ideas of the female body, and about the social circumstances of women's health care. When we get to read parts of the Trotula later in the week, we'll have an opportunity to address questions like these. But before getting to that, I'd like to set the scene and provide some context. Specifically, I'd like us to learn a little bit about why this text emerged when and where it did. One of the things that we should know before getting into the Trotula is that these three texts were just a small fragment of the medical literature emerging from Italy in the 11th and 12th centuries. During this period, the southern part of the country was experiencing an explosion in medical publishing, and much of it centered around Salerno, a prosperous city that sat on the edge of a vast network of Mediterranean trade. Connected through commerce to North Africa, Sicily, the Levant, and other Italian cities, medieval Salerno was an exceptionally wealthy place. It was also a demographically diverse city, home to the Lombards, a Germanic people, to several enclaves of Greek speakers, to a community of about 600 Jews, and to native-born Italians. While there were no resident Muslim communities within the city at the time, the inhabitants of Salerno were certainly aware of Muslim culture as well, as the writings of the Spanish historian Ibn Jubayar who traveled through the Mediterranean in 1184 and 1185, make clear. Traveling through nearby Palermo, Ibn Jubayr was surprised by how eagerly the city's Christian women adopted the customs of local Muslim women, as you can see from the excerpt on this slide. As this passage suggests, 
Many of the women of southern Italy at this time were fairly wealthy. However, their wealth did not generally come to them independently. The city of Salerno was governed by rather strict laws that limited women's mobility and their ability to possess their own sources of wealth. Typically, the city's women spent their whole lives under the guardianship of a male, until they were married, their father, after that, their husband, and if he died, then their adult sons, brothers, or other male relatives. Women could not inherit their father's property, and from what we know, it seems that women's literacy rates in Salerno were lower than other parts of Italy. There is also not much evidence to suggest that Salernitan women engaged in trades, owned businesses, or partook of any significant commercial activity at all. Women's lives were expected to consist of marriage and maternity, and they were always dependent on the support of male guardians. Of course, there were important class differences among women, and generally, Salernitan citizens were known across Italy for their aspirations to nobility. Certainly, some were wealthy enough to afford the services of sophisticated medical practitioners, and it appears that rich women were among those patients whose patronage doctors wanted to earn. This, in part, explains the emergence and subsequent popularity of the Trotula. Of course, this collection was not the first Western text on women's medicine. The earliest gynecological treatises appeared in ancient Greece, where one finds texts like Diseases of Women among the Hippocratic Corpus. A second major figure in pre-Salernitan gynecology was Serranus. Serranus was a Greek physician who practiced in Rome during the 1st and 2nd centuries CE. His books, like those of Hippocratic writers, were copied, translated, and reprinted many times over the succeeding centuries. Southern Italian doctors also learned about gynecology through translations of Arabic medical texts, which typically combined the ideas of Soranus and Galen. Particularly important here were the writings of a Tunisian doctor named Ibn al-Jazar, whose Viaticum, as it was known in Latin, was a seven-volume series on medical diagnosis and therapy. Its sixth book was devoted entirely to diseases of the reproductive organs, and the author of one of the texts of the Trotula, the book called Conditions of Women, drew heavily upon this as a source. The text was translated by a drug merchant from Tunis, known to history as Constantine the African. A native speaker of Arabic, Constantine the African immigrated to Salerno in the mid-1050s and became part of a vibrant community of medical translators who, like him, spent their lives in the Abbey of Monte Cassino rendering various Arabic medical texts into Latin. He himself translated at least 20 books, each of which helped tr transform Salerno into a center of medical learning. By the beginning of the 11th century, Salerno had acquired a reputation for medical excellence all across the region. The work of translators like Constantine the African encouraged a turn toward a more learned, sophisticated, theoretical, philosophical kind of medicine, one that was grounded in Hippocratic thought. As a result of this, certain practitioners were able to enhance their social status through mastering these texts. As an example of the philosophical turn in medieval Italian medicine, consider one of the three books of the Trotula, Conditions of Women. Devoted to gynecological and obstetrical conditions, the text discusses a variety of subjects, including menstrual problems, uterine conditions, the control of fertility, and aids for complications in childbirth. Engaging in theoretical debates, Conditions of Women reflects the increasingly philosophical nature of Salernitan medicine in the 11th and 12th centuries. It is also one of the first Italian medical texts to synthesize information from Arabic sources. On the whole, it is very much indebted to Greco-Roman and Arabic medicine, and its explanations of and prescriptions for women's reproductive maladies differ little from those of ancient times. 
Like the medical texts of antiquity, it is obsessed with menstruation. It argues that the maintenance of regular menstruation is vital to the maintenance of health. Whereas today, we see menstruation as a mere byproduct of the female reproductive cycle, in Hippocratic thought, menstruation was a necessary purgation, a monthly draining of blood needed to keep the entire female organism healthy. Thus, much of conditions of women consists of tips for provoking the menses. This book also accepts the ancient Hippocratic view of the wandering womb, that is, the idea that the uterus can move throughout the body and suffocate different organs. Treatments for this disease, which was called uterine suffocation, varied, but one of the most popular was odoriferous therapy, that is, the use of both foul-smelling and sweet-smelling substances, which, when applied to both the nose and the genitals, were thought to help the uterus return to its normal place within the body. Grounded in ancient medical theories, this treatment demonstrates some of the ways that educated Salernitan doctors were trying to synthesize the new Arabic medicine with older Hippocratic traditions. None of this should be taken to mean that Salerno was only a place of educated, literate, well-read doctors. There was no regulation of medical practice during this time, and because of this, Salerno boasted an open medical marketplace. Those who used religious and or magical methods of healing continued to exist alongside this new breed of philosophical practitioners and those without access to formal institutions of learning were still able to earn a living as healers. This included women. Indeed, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that women practiced medicine in 11th and 12th century Salerno. Local medical texts published during this period contain references to about five dozen different Salernitan women credited for their medical skills. While these texts only provide a limited picture of female doctors' practices, they do show us that these women were not confined to any specific area of medicine. Among other things, they are credited with therapies for gastrointestinal disorders, skin problems, pediatric conditions, and gynecological dysfunction. On the basis of these references, it seems that Salerno's women healers were mostly empirics, that is, people who discovered new uses for medicinal substances, but appear not to have written any books or engaged in any theorizing. The sole exception here is Trata. Trata's medical practices are attested to in a couple of different compendiums, including a 12th century compilation called On the Treatment of Illnesses. Here, Trotta is spoken of as someone with considerable expertise in the fields of gastrointestinal disorders and ophthalmology. It appears that she was author of one of the three texts contained in the Trotula, the volume called Treatments for Women. Indeed, it may be that Treatments for Women is a transcript of Trotta's cures, as she orally recounted them to a scribe, who then added further elements on his own. Either way, it is entirely appropriate to consider her as the principal source for this text. Now that we've had a chance to place the Trotula within the historical context of medicine in late medieval Salerno, we're ready to approach this text and to analyze it. As you read th through Treatments for Women, please think about the following questions. Once you've got some tentative thoughts about these questions, please head over to our discussion board and share your views. I'm really eager to see what you have to say and look forward to discussing this important primary source text with you all.